Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, just a, a couple quick things before we get started. Uh, this is, of course, End of the Deep. It's our second one. So we had the first one last month. It's the second Thursday of every month. And we're hoping that this will go on indefinitely to help provide people a deeper look into the faith that we all share. Now, what the ba- so several knows essential stuff. The bathrooms are down the hall right back there so just take a left here a right and then you'll see them Uh, this is being taped we have a camera up there so please turn off your phones we hope that the people watching this on video or and it's also going to be put on saint gabriel radio we don't want them to hear lots of noise so if you have to leave please try to do so quietly Um, the talk will go about eh, 50 minutes i don't know how precise i'll get it but i'll do my best and then we'll have a short break and then questions and answers. So please save your questions. You can write them down in your sheet. Save your questions for the end. And we'll have about 30 minutes for questions. And then if anyone didn't get one already, there's handouts back there. And you can watch this again if you like it. It'll be on our web page. It'll link to our YouTube channel for Into the Deep. And it's also going to play on St. Gabriel Radio. So that's another way. <laughs> Make sure the mic's on this time. All right, let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, please send your Spirit down upon us. Give us help to know and to love you more and more. Help us grow in our faith to see the realities that you show us and to live it in our daily life. And let us pray together in the words our Lord gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So this is the second talk. So the first was about a bird's eye view of Christianity. And so we gave the big picture of everything. But the the question, the natural question is, well, how do we know any of that? How do we know all this stuff we talk about as Christians, about Jesus, about the Trinity, about the spiritual life? How do we know any of those things? And it's a fair question. And there's a real short answer. God told us. We know it because God tells us. Now, I could leave it there, and then it would be a a one-minute talk, but but I think I'll try to expand on that a little bit, is that we know it because God tells us, and we have faith in what God tells us. So really what we're talking about, of how do we know all these Christian things, we're talking about faith. We're talking about God's revelation to us. And I want to start with, well, why did God give us these things we know by faith. Uh, Why did he tell us all those things that we were talking about last month? Well, he didn't give it to us as idle knowledge, as mere curiosities where we say, well, thanks, that was really interesting. Thanks for sharing. You know, I'll go back to whatever it was I was doing before. No, he told us all these things that we know in the faith. He told them because they're essential for us to know, that it's necessary and important for us to know what it is that God is telling us because what it is is not just random abstract facts but it's a call it's a calling to us it's calling us somewhere it's calling us to someone it's a a light this knowledge of the faith is a light to guide us on that journey ultimately to god and we see that it's a light that helps preserve us from the darkness that often envelops this world and we can see that all around us where people question, well, what is the purpose of my life? What is the meaning? How do I know what I should do with my life? How I should live? What's right or wrong? Uh, Just go to the self-help section of a bookstore and you'll see thousands of different answers. You'll see all sorts of contradictory things about what life can mean. And, And most people, if they're honest, they struggle with those big questions of life. What's the meaning? Why am I here? And that's the darkness that these things are not self-evident to us. We're not born knowing, of course I know what the meaning of life is. It's something we we struggle to determine, struggle to find out. 
And a lot of people, they'll, they'll deaden themselves with just mindless entertainment to not have to ask these big questions. But if we want to ask them, if we want to know what the purpose of life is, of our meaning, then we know because God has broken into this world and Jesus Christ and revealed these things to us. He tells us. So the faith it's a light to guide us on our journey because it reveals who we are and who God is and what our situation is. So who we are, where, we're he- where we are now, where we're headed with God, and our situation, the-, the path we have to travel to live out the faith. And what we learn ultimately is that God is calling us to friendship, to salvation, to reunion with him. He's calling us to save us from the separation from him. And this is what all last month was about. And what begins that pilgrimage is at first having faith and knowing this message that God wants to share with us. And so one way we always see the the spiritual life is as a pilgrimage, a holy journey. We're led by faith. And what the faith is, is it's like our mission briefing for this journey. It's our need to know information. Uh, I knew someone uh, years ago, and he did a lot of high school retreats, and he had this really corny acronym. And, and even though it's corny, I'm going to I'm going to share it. It's uh, he said the Bible is basic instructions before leaving Earth, and, and that it, it's corny, but it's true in a way that this is our mission briefing for how we ought to live our life. It gives us the knowledge we need in order to be the type of person God is calling us to be. So. Next, I want to talk about then, what is this thing we call faith? Um, It's a vague word often in the modern culture. People will say things like, well, you have to have faith, but they won't specify it. Or you just need faith, you just need to believe in something. And so it becomes this free-floating term without much content to it. And, And when you do that, it becomes meaningless because faith in what? Faith in whom? Faith about what? What am I supposed to believe in? And so it's those questions I want to answer today. What do we mean when we say faith? More than just, well, you got to have faith, whatever that is. What do we mean by that? And I want to start with a more general concept than faith, belief in general, because there's there's different types of ways to know something, a fact. You can have direct knowledge. So you can say, well, who's speaking now? Well, Father Boniface. Well, how do you know that? Well, you can see me. You have direct knowledge. You could say, well, St. Patrick's is in Columbus. Well, how do you know? Well, you've you've seen St. Patrick's and it's right in the middle of Columbus. You have direct knowledge. But then there's also belief. When we say, I believe something, it's not that I've seen it directly with my own eyes, but someone else has told me about it and I believe what that person says. So we always, when we have belief, we believe something because of the testimony of someone else. That's how belief works. And and then that person that tells you, he has to have direct knowledge, or there must be some chain to direct knowledge somewhere. When when you say, I believe you, it's usually because that person says, I've seen it with my own eyes. I know it's true, and I want, and you should believe what I'm saying. If you, so you want there to be, if you believe someone, that there's somewhere on that, that those levels that there's direct knowledge. If it's a circle of belief, it doesn't attack to direct knowledge anywhere. It's kind of, well, it doesn't really lead anywhere. So belief is you believe something in someone who himself has direct knowledge. And so that gives us two parts, the testimony that we can believe or not, and the one who testifies to that testimony. Now, direct knowledge is obviously the best type of knowledge. If you know it directly, if you saw it with your own eyes, that's the best. But a lot of times we don't have direct knowledge. We, we can't have direct knowledge. It's not possible for one reason or another. And in fact, a lot of our knowledge that we have, and I mean knowledge just in a normal sense of the word, it, it's based on belief because we don't have an ability to have a direct vision of it. So for instance, in a courtroom, you have witnesses that testify. Like, I saw Joe Smith in the parlor with the knife, you know, wh- whatever. <laughs> you know, we, it's the only time you didn't have a video camera in that parlor so all you can have is witnesses to testify or science if a scientist reads the experiments of other scientists he's working on belief that those studies are accurate that they saw with their own eyes that experiment worked no scientist can personally run every single experiment 
that he bases his theory on. You, you just can't do it. So you, you read what peer review journals and you take it on belief that those experiments are really run and that those people are giving you direct testimony about what they found. Or, or basically all of our historical knowledge, that none of us were alive in the year 1000. So we base it upon the testimony of people who were alive back then, the records that you found, maybe stuff that archeologists tell us about what they found by digging it up. But, but all you can have about historical facts is belief because we, none of us were around back then. Uh, this is to say that belief is not some strange form of knowing, but so much of what we call our knowledge is based upon believing other people. And what's central to belief is the person testifying, the person telling you that he has knowledge. Because you want to ask, if someone says, well, this is the case and you should believe me, you'd always say, well, is this guy credible? Should I believe him? Does what he say, is what he's saying, does it make any sense? So someone comes up to you and says, you know, I've seen Bigfoot many times. And he's kind of crazy, and he smells bad. And you, know, you probably shouldn't take that as a credible witness. You, know, you, you want to think, like, is this guy believable? Does his story make any sense? And so what's central for belief is, well, is the person giving me this testimony reliable? Also, there's a element of freedom that's always there with belief, that somebody can tell us a very compelling story and you think, well, I, I, that sounds true, that's likely to be the case. But because we don't see it with our own eyes, there's a the freedom that we could say, well, I'm, yeah, whatever, I don't believe it. We have that freedom because we don't see it with our own eyes. We have to make the decision that I'm going to believe in this witness. Now the bottom line in all this stuff about belief is that, is that we believe in someone about something. And that's important because faith itself is a special type of belief. So you have the wide category of belief, and within that there's this very special type of belief that we as Christians call faith. And, and it's important, I went through all that stuff about belief because, you know, remember I was talking about the modern, you, you see in loose terminology, faith, you just need faith. Well, what's important to know about faith is who are we believing in and what are we believing? That these are crucial questions for faith or belief and thus faith to make any sense. We have to know who it is that we're believing and what we're told to believe. And so these are very important. You know, it's very different to believe in God than to believe in the crazy Bigfoot watcher. Now, what makes faith a special kind of belief? Because it's very particular. Well, the most the most clear reason is because what the person we're believing in with faith is God. It's not just another human being. It's not just Joe Smith testifying about the parlor. It, it's God himself speaking to us. And that's, that's a game changer. It changes everything about faith versus belief in general. Why? Because God, because it's God. So God's what? God's all knowing. He knows everything. So there's no chance that he made a mistake when he tells you something. You know, if a normal person gives you testimony, you say, well, did he, did he misremember it? Or did he get confused about the date? Well, this is God. There's no chance of a mistake, unlike with human, human people that testify. Second, God's all good. He's a source of all goodness. And so there's no chance that he's seeking to deceive us, that, that God might be lying to us, trying to fool us, because he's God. So there's no question of the motives, like you might guess with a human, like, well, maybe he's trying to manipulate me. Maybe this is a clever lie just to get my bank account number. No, this is, this is God. He's all good. Also, God's the creator of the universe, that everything that exists in this world exists because God made it, called it out of nothingness. And that gives God a unique knowledge of this world. You think of it like this. So say you're in class and you're studying a novel. And you're, you're trying to figure out what the novel's getting at. What's the point of the novel? And you run into the author and you ask him, well, what did you mean by this part? What did it mean when this character said this or did that? Well, that would have extra weight if the author of the book said, well, you know, I meant by that this, this, and this. You're like, wow, that's a unique insight to this book because he wrote it. Well, it's the same with uh, when, we, when we hear from God about our world. It's a unique insight because he is the creator 
of this world. And finally, God is the source of all love, that we know that the reason that he tells us things, that he reveals truths to us, is because of his love for us. And so it gives us reason to trust in what's behind the communication he makes with us. Now, the things he tells us, they're th because of that unique vision of God's, you know, the God's eye view in the world, he answers for us, he gives us in faith, the things that we couldn't otherwise know. So if belief is belief in someone about something, on the about something side, he's telling us things we couldn't know on our own. So we can't tell each other, based on our own personal experience, what life after death is like, because none of us are dead. You know, we just don't have that insight in terms of direct knowledge. But God does know what happens and can tell us. Um, he could tell us, why is there something rather than nothing? Or what's the meaning of the world? And he knows these things in a unique way because he gave the world meaning. And so these are things that we couldn't just figure out by our own experience. We don't have the perspective of being outside the world and the creator of the world to know these things on our own. We might be able to guess or give arguments, but we can't know for certain. But God does. And so that gives his testimony a unique weight that no human testimony could. It makes it different than anything a human could say. Now, a lot of important things follow from all that. And that's, not, that's part of what makes the faith distinctive. Because of the fact that it's God revealing it, it makes a lot of things different than a normal belief. So first, remember I was saying direct knowledge is better than indirect knowledge? The person that sees with his own eyes has better knowledge than someone that just hears that person's testimony. Well, that, it's true that direct knowledge is a better kind of knowledge, but it's different when God is the one giving the testimony. That when God's testifying, what he says is more certain even than our direct knowledge. So, it's the most, so in other words, the faith is the most certain knowledge we have because it comes from God. Uh, and that's always important because we tend to put our own opinions before the faith a lot of times, or we're really sure of what we think. And so people's, say, personal opinions, political ideology, this, whatever, can creep in and say, well, I'm going to judge the faith in terms of these notions that I have. But really, what's most certain is what God tells us, because we're easily mistaken. We can get all sorts of things wrong. I mean, just think of when we were 18 and how many mistaken notions of the world we might have had at that time. I know I did. I thought a lot of silly things when I was 18. Well, we can be mistaken, but God can't because he's God. Um, and so the question is, when we look at the faith, is not whether I think God is right or not. It's not a question of content, but it's a question of, do I believe that it's God that's spoken? And if the answer is yes, then because it's God speaking, we have to believe what he says. So it's not a question of the content, it's a question, do I believe that God has spoken, yes or no? And that sets you, that, that's really what decides it. If it's no, then it's, why pay any attention to it? And if it's yes, then our response is, well, then I ought to believe it because it's God. That, that also means that, that what we know in the faith, it's really an all or nothing thing. If it's yes, God has spoken, then I believe all of it because God has spoken. And if it's no, then why should I give it any heed? So, in other words, coming to the faith, coming to know things through the faith, is very different than, say, someone joining a political party. If you join a political party, what do you do? You, you think, okay, well, which party do I agree with the most? Which one's most in accord with, I, with what I believe? And then I'll join that party. But it's not like that with the faith because it's not something, it's not a matter of, well, did, the, did God say enough that I liked or not like? No, it's did God speak or did God not speak? It's not a matter of finding what I already believed and whether it matches, but whether I believe that God has spoken or not. And we believe ultimately because God has spoken. Now, this, this is lots of uh, implications for a lot of people because they, you hear about you hear this phrase, uh, cafeteria Catholicism. That, that really doesn't make a lot of sense under this analysis because it, it's not a question of what parts I like, but whether God has spoken. Another implication then 
is that our faith must be based upon Jesus, that it's centered on we believe it because God has spoken. This is a, a spiritual importance because if our faith rests on something besides Jesus Christ, it will crumble when it's tested. So what do I mean? Well, some people might be say they're Christian because, say, uh, I was raised Christian. It was my heritage. So, so, you know, I just kept doing it. Or a lot of my friends are Christian, and, and I like them, so I'm Christian too. Or I think the faith is beautiful. It's produced a lot of beautiful artwork, and it, its theories all hang together, and I find that really beautiful, so I'm Christian. Or, or I don't know, a lot of people that I agree with politically are Christian, so I'm Christian. None of those are sufficient reasons. It's not rooted deeply enough. The reason to be Christian is because we have faith in God, because God has spoken to us. That has to be the foundation of our faith. Not that I think that it's beautiful. You can think all these things. Your friends can all be Christian. Your heritage might be Christian. That's great. But the, at the heart of your faith has to be that connection to Jesus Christ and a belief in the Word of God and what He has revealed to us. Because what will happen is we'll all be tempted. Christ is explicit about this, that our, our faith will be tested. And if Christ is not our sure foundation, then it will come tumbling down at one point when our faith is tested. So that has to be the root, that, that encounter and trust in Jesus Christ as God. Another thing that follows from faith as belief is that the faith helps us to know other truths better that things of the world we know better because we have the standard of faith. Faith, because it's revealed by God, gives us the most certain knowledge we have. Well, that helps us to know when we're thinking about things outside the faith, things of the world. It gives us a guide to know, well, have I gotten this right or wrong? So, for example, the faith teaches us of the inherent dignity of every human person. Well, then we know that if somebody's denying that, if someone's saying, well, certain people don't have dignity, certain people should be discarded, then we know that if that's where our thinking has led us, that we've gotten off track, that we've gone wrong somewhere in our thinking, because our faith calls us back to that more fundamental truth. And so the, the, the problem with people who put politics before the faith is that it should be the other way around. It's the faith that judges everything else we know. It's our highest form of knowledge. So when we say something like, well, certain people are disposable, we know you're way off track because something essential to the faith has been denied. And so the faith helps us know when we've gone wrong in our thinking. Now, the faith also includes things that we could know otherwise. You know, there, not everything is beyond our knowledge. So, for instance, you have the, the Ten Commandments. Well, a lot of people would know, even if they're not Christian, that say you shouldn't murder people or you shouldn't cheat on your spouse or things like that. But God gives it to us in the faith because it, it, it's like a shortcut. He tells us things that we could have probably known on our own, but he's, he's given it affirmation so that we don't get off track. And this is a part of the faith being a judge, the highest standard we have for judging other things that we know. Also, related to that, there's something, now I'm going to use a, a big term, but I'm going to explain it. It's called the preambula fidei, and, and that means the things that walk before the faith. In other words, there are things that, if you know them, makes it easier to accept the faith. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, remember when we were talking about belief, and there's, uh, you, you judge the credibility of the person. So if somebody starts talking about Bigfoot, you go, ah, Bigfoot's not real. There's, there's, there's a bunch of bunk. Well, that's, there's things that, if you know them, make it easier to say yes to the gospel, to assess the credibility. So, for instance... Uh, if you think that God doesn't exist, if you're a strident atheist, it's going to make it really hard to accept the revelation of Jesus Christ because you're going to say, no, he's not God because God doesn't exist. And this is important because the, these things really matter, this natural knowledge that we have. So it's not a question of faith versus all other knowledge, but it's faith that enlightens other knowledge as its standard and also that, that makes our other knowledge valuable because it helps prepare us for the faith. The truth prepares us to know more of the truth. Um, and so a natural knowledge is really important as well as the faith. This is why the u whole university system came out of the Christian West, because of this insistence and the importance of knowing the truth, not just of the faith, 
but all truth that's available to us, to see the harmony between faith and natural knowledge. Um, one, one other thing on this list I've been doing in the importance of faith is that faith must be lived. This is what we started with, that faith, it gives us a light for our journey, that faith is not just abstract knowledge and principles, but it's a light that we act from. And, and so that, this is really important things for, because the root of morality, when we think of Christian morality, it's not just rules slapped down, but it's rooted in the truth that we know from the faith and how do we live those truth, that, truths out in our own life. So for instance, we, we spoke before about the inherent dignity of every human person. Well, that's why certain things are, are considered immoral, such as you say, murder, abortion, human slavery, you know, all the things that would be an affront to human dignity. Well, those aren't just rules dropped down by God, but it's part of the way in which the truths, the, li- the truths of the light of faith reveal the path that we should take in our own lives, what's right and what's wrong. And so the root of it comes through, through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, th- this, I brought this point up specifically is that faith is meant to be lived, to be active, because this is something that right now is, in the wider culture is being denied in some quarters, because you see this split where, well, you can believe what you want, but you have to act like you don't believe it. And what I'm thinking specifically are the religious liberty issues that are cropping up, that, that regardless of your profession, whatever you believe in the privacy of your own head, that's fine. But when you interact with the world, you have to act like a good atheist, a good secularist who doesn't believe those things. Um, this is the, the limitation of conscience rights, that saying you can't act on it. It's not right. But that, that makes no sense, because if the faith is the light for our journey that's supposed to lead us and how we interact with the world, how we see the world, then to act contrary to the faith, the faith that you believe, is to ask people to enact a lie in their lives, to say, I, I, you might see that as true, but I want you to act as if it's false. It's asking people to be a liar in their own actions and in their life. And so as Christians, we have to always reject that, that dichotomy between what we believe and what we do, because they go together. If we really believe it, it affects how we act. So if you have someone who's a mass murderer and says, but I believe in human dignity, you say, no, you don't. <laughs> Look what you did. <laughs> Look what you did with your life. That we need an integrity to ourselves of what we believe and what we act. So I want to talk now about I've been talking a lot about belief. So, I mean, I guess it's a talk on faith, so that's to be expected. But what about unbelief? People who don't believe, what, what about that situation? Well, first off, that we're created for belief, that God created us to know and trust in him. So there's something really unnatural about unbelief. But it's a possibility because remember that belief is always an act of freedom. You're never compelled to believe in the testimony of another person. And so in that act of freedom, you can deny the faith. It it happens. But why why do people reject the faith? Why is there unbelief? Well, for some people, it's intellectual reasons. It might be, well, I'm not sure about the proofs of God. You know, I've gone through Aquinas' five proofs for God. I'm not so sure God exists. Or it could be, I can't see how the Trinity isn't self-contradictory as a theory. I mean, that that happens, and that's a question in some respects of the, remember the preambula fidei, that there's certain truths about the world that they've gotten wrong, and it prevents them from being able to intellectually accept the faith. And uh, you see it's like, say, materialist. All that exists is matter, and so there can't be a spiritual God because spirit doesn't exist. There could be things like that. But those, I think, are the rare cases. The reason people reject the faith more often is because they don't want to live out the implications of the faith. And so you might have a discussion with somebody about what the faith teaches, and what's really underneath it is someone might be thinking, yeah, but if I agree with you, then I'm going to have to move out of my girlfriend's apartment, and so I'm not going to agree with you. I mean, it's that desire not to have to live what the faith tells us, to, to create our own truth, really, to create our own reality, our own rules of living by. And that makes it a very old issue. As you remember way back in Genesis 3, 
that when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, and it says that you will be like gods. That's always a temptation to deny the truth of God so that we can create our own truth, our own rules, our own way of being. So what about that? Does it work? I mean, does it work to say, well, I'm going to ignore the truth. I'm going to reject it. I'm going to create my own rules on how I'm going to live. Well, the problem with that is it's not true that we didn't create ourselves. I didn't say, okay, today I'm going to be born or today I'm going to come into existence. And I think I'm going to come as a human. No, we didn't create ourselves. We were just born at a certain time and place, you know, beyond our control. And we didn't pick to be human. It was a gift that was given to us. And, and our own humanity brings a certain way in which we find happiness. That we all know to be happy as a human means some things and not others. And so we don't really have the power to redefine the rules of our own lives because all it is ultimately is a delusion. It's a denial of the truth of our own humanity and what it means to be human. And what it will ultimately do is it'll bring misery if you try to rewrite all the rules of what it means to be human, to reject God's truths. Um, because what it is ultimately to accept the faith is to accept that there's a truth higher than our own wills, our own desires. To say that I might want to do this, but I know there's a higher truth that says I shouldn't do that. And this is really important because the reason why saying I'm going to reject God's way and invent my own doesn't work is because it doesn't actually bring about freedom and happiness. And the reason why is this, is that, is that what happens? Okay, by accepting God, I'm saying there's a truth higher than myself. And that means that there's something above me that judges how I should act, what I should do. If I reject that, then what becomes the highest standard for how I act, how I live my life? What it will inevitably be is what I desire what it is that made me want to reject God. So say I want to live for money, and I say, well, if I follow God, then I can't live to make as much money as possible, or seek as much fame as possible, or as much physical pleasure, whatever you list. And so by rejecting God and putting what I desire first, I don't become free, I become a slave to that desire, because that's what's going to be the norm, the, rule, the ruler of my life, is that desire. And it cannot bring happiness that we don't actually achieve happiness by picking a desire and fulfilling it as much as possible. You become like a person with poison ivy that constantly scratches and scratches and it itches more and more and never seems to go away. That's what happens when we live simply to fulfill our desires, when we say that my desires are my God and the rule I follow. follow. And where it leads to is because it doesn't produce the happiness it promises, is it leads to despair. It leads to a certain despair. But it's hard to see that. See, at the end, it leads to despair. And you see this in the confessional all the time. You see people on various tracks on first picking the sin and then giving themselves over to it and the despair it leads to. But they don't see it at the beginning. Because part of, remember at the beginning, I was talking about faith gives light into the darkness of the world. Part of that darkness is, is it's hard to see what's actually good for us in the moment. There's a, a word, that it's, in the, um, it's in a part of the baptism. It says, the, do you reject the glamour of sin? That word glamour, um, what it comes from in, in the Middle Ages, in the Middle English, is it was a word of witchcraft, that, that when a witch cast a spell, it put a glamour, which made something that wasn't good look good. And so it's interesting that it's now used by the fashion industry. That, but... <laughs> That glamour is what attracts us. Is it's something that, that's not really good for us, but it looks like it will make me happy if I follow that route. And that's the darkness of the world that we don't see through it. And that's the, that's the importance of the faith that God gives us, is the way it leads us on our journey, on our pilgrimage, is by showing us the truth of the world around us that we don't always see, and that we often get wrong by our own reasoning, but shows us a sure way to find that happiness our hearts seek and to avoid the false paths and the dead ends that we're always liable to fall into. And so that's why it's the light guiding us. But it only happens when we accept that that light is above us, that there is something above us. And it's, and it's not just our will, but God himself who loves us and seeks our salvation. So, okay, I've been talking about faith in kind of very broad existential terms. I want to 
put a little bit more detail on what I mean by faith. Um, because uh, if you read the Catechism on Faith, it'll give a much more detailed definition than I've been giving so far. So I want to go into a little bit of those details. Faith is a supernatural virtue. There's a technical Catholic term, a supernatural virtue. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, supernatural, so we know what natural means, you know, natural history, natural this, natural foods. It's just how they are in the world. And supernatural means something higher than the things that we find in this world. So you can't find a supernatural thing in the grocery store, only natural things. But you, you have to go some, to someone above this world to receive something supernatural. And so what God is giving us in a supernatural virtue is a virtue that's above our own ability to attain. So you can build up a natural virtue by your own powers, but a supernatural virtue is above our human potentiality. And so we have to receive it from God. And that means that, that the, as a supernatural virtue, that faith is a gift. It's a gift of grace that we can't attain on our own. It only comes because God offers it and we choose to receive it. And that's important because remember how belief, to accept a belief, there's a moment of freedom where you can say yes or no to believing. That that's there with the faith too, that you say yes or no to when that gift is offered to you by the Holy Spirit and that we can't compel other people to believe. They have to make that their own act of freedom. That you can't conjole or nag or coerce anyone into believing in God. You might remove airs that, that get in the way, that build up that preambula fidei, if you remember that, but you can't make someone believe because they have to exercise that act of freedom. And that's offered when we encounter God. Because if belief is believing in someone, then to have the faith, you have to have an encounter with God where it's offered, where it's offered to you to believe what the truth, what the faith proposes, and you say yes in that moment, that to either believe the testimony of Christ or not. Now, it's also a virtue. So it's a supernatural virtue, and a virtue is a habit of acting. It's like our character, the person we choose to become by our repeated actions in our lives. And so a virtue is always a way of acting. It's something about us that influences how we interact with the world, what we're likely to do or not do. Like, so like a comedian has the, the, the habit of being funny. You know, he's good at it. He's quick at it. He sees things in terms of humor. And what, what, what is the end result of, say, a virtue of humor? Telling jokes. Well, faith is a virtue. Then it's supposed to lead to action as well. But the action would be actions of faith that the point of the, the knowledge at being a virtue, that faith being a virtue, is that it leads us to do things, acts of faith. And so what are those? Well, there's, there's two aspects to the acts of faith. The first is internal, because the, the faith is something we believe that our mind comprehends. And so it's internal to us. And that is first, and this is pretty obvious, to believe, to believe what's proposed by God, to see the world in terms of that belief. And the second is external, outside of us, not just in our heads and our minds. And that's to confess the faith, to profess the faith, to say it, uh, to live by the light of what we've accepted as belief. Now, ver uh, faith is, uh, so I saved the first part, a supernatural virtue, whereby we believe the truths revealed by God because God has revealed it. So we've already covered that. We know that we believe in the faith because God has revealed it. And, and we call that, that's why we call it revelation. That's the content of what's revealed. But the object, what it is we believe, so the object of faith is that content of the things we say yes to, the content of the testimony that Christ gives us. And it's God and the things related to God. So what God's ultimately telling us is about himself, who God is. And the, two, the heart of revelation of what God has revealed is that, one, that God's a trinity, and two, that Jesus Christ is both God and man and has come to save us. The heart of what God reveals is who he is. And, so, and that's because what the heart of the Christian life is, is that God has offered us not just to believe in him, but to be friends with him. He's inviting us to become friends with God. And to, the first thing of that is to explain, well, who is it that's inviting us to be a friend? He's telling us. 
this is who I am as God, that I love you and I've saved you and I invite you to be my friend, to follow me in your life. And he's giving us the faith to, to, to start us on that journey of friendship with God. And that's the content of it. Now, there's all sorts of stuff in the faith that, that can be mysterious. We hear this, the mysteries of the faith. Because, and we, we should expect that because remember that the faith is a God's eye view. That is God speaking to us from his perspective as God, which is very different than our human perspective. And so some of the things he tells us about divine reality are way beyond our normal ability to understand. It's like, think of, uh, think of a four-year-old boy at a physics conference with all these physics PhDs talking about particle accelerators and this and condensed matter, and I think that's all the physics terms I have. But uh, <laughs> you know, they're talking about all these things. Well, how much is a four-year-old going to get from that talk? Very little, very little. But he'll get. He'll probably catch a few words, a few terms of jargon. Maybe he'll get kind of the gist of one of the talks. Maybe, but most of it's beyond his understanding. Well, the difference between a four-year-old and a physics professor. Is, is infinitely smaller than the difference between a human and God. But the difference between our knowledge is much, much larger. And so what God tells us, are, they're often mysterious because our minds are just not infinite. They're, not, they're too finite to understand the infinities of God. So we can say things like Jesus is two natures but one person, or the Trinity is three persons but one God. I mean, what, well, we can say that, and we know it's true as far as we say it, but, but the full depth of what that means is beyond our ability to see. And it's not because it's dark, but because it's so bright our minds can't take it in, that our eyesight, the sharpness of our minds, is not keen enough to see the depths of what God has revealed. And so the faith can be mysterious, but it's mysterious because of the weakness of our minds as creatures not because of the obscurity in God. So here's a more practical question. How do we know the things that God reveals? Like, okay, well, this is great. God, I want to say yes to God, but how do we, practically speaking, know the things of the faith? Well, I mean, the key there is Jesus, the Word of God. He is the fullness of revelation, is Jesus Christ. And right now, Jesus is present in the world through his body, the church. That's Christ's presence. The head is in heaven, ascended to heaven, one of the mysteries of the rosary. And we, the body, are still here on earth, or at least the, some of us are. And so it's through the body of Christ, the church, that the faith is spread. And so the church teaches us teachings that are based upon Scripture. The church put together Scripture itself. The, the New Testament was codified, codified by the early church. Uh, they took what was read in the churches and the liturgies, and that's what composed the New Testament. So the church gives us the scriptures is one way to come to know the faith. Um, but then when we read those scriptures, there's a tradition of the church, the body of Christ, of meditating over the scriptures century after century after millennia and coming to a deeper and deeper understanding of these divine mysteries. And all of that pondering, like reading a book over and over and over again and seeing more and more deeply, that is all guided by the Holy Spirit who's in the church guiding us. And of course, we have the, the magisterium to help guide us in the faith, because without it, we'd be in trouble. I mean, think of it. If you just had to figure it out, Christianity, just with the Bible, and no help, like you never met another Christian in a desert island, all you got is the Bible. Well, good luck trying to get it all right, because it can be, I mean, you read Paul, he's pretty confusing at times. That we, we often need help, and it's easy to make a lot of mistakes. And most people don't have time to get a PhD in scripture and learn Greek and Hebrew and Syriac. And even if they do, it's easy to make mistakes. So, so we have this whole tradition of the church to help us get the faith right. And that's important because getting the faith right is necessary for our lives. It's necessary for us. If it's the light that guides us to happiness and salvation, it's really important to, to, to be able to be right about what the faith says and what it doesn't say. And that's why the Holy Spirit guides the church to help all of us to make sure that the light that we live by is the pure light of the Holy Spirit. So the faith is revealed most fully in Jesus Christ. And that 
gift of faith is received through the Holy Spirit in the church. It's usually given first in baptism. And, and we learn to deepen that faith within the body of the church. And so that someone might say, well, yeah, that's a really long-winded answer to how do we actually know the faith. I mean, the short, the short answer is, well, the catechism of the Catholic Church is a great way to learn the content of the faith. It, it summarizes the tradition. It summarizes all the great theologians. It gives us a, a sure guide to the faith. So, so the short answer is, how do I know the contents of the faith? We'll read the catechism. All right, one last section. I think I have a little time left. Is how do we grow in the faith? How do we grow in the supernatural virtue of faith? Well, the first thing to do, if you want to grow in faith, is remember it's a gift. Pray for it. Pray to the Holy Spirit. Every day you should pray for faith, hope, and love. This is the way we advance in the pilgrimage of, of the spiritual life, of the Christian life, is by growing in faith, hope, and love. And all of these are gifts. And so pray for an increase in those gifts. There are grace that's given to us. Also, the play, if it's a grace, the place to get grace. I, got this, I love this question. I got this in RCIA. And we had uh, a session on what is grace. And everyone was getting excited. They're like, oh, grace, that's awesome. And we're talking all the things grace does. And this one woman, she was getting more and more excited. And she says, well, that's really wonderful. But where do I get grace? <laughs> you, know? you know, you can't, you can't well, go down to the Hills Market and find, you know, oh, grace is on sale. Grace, you know, it doesn't work that way. Well, the place where we get grace, the channel, the spigot where grace pours out are the sacraments of the church. They're like the plumbing in the church. And so... If you want to grow in faith, stay close to the sacraments. Stay close to the Mass. Stay, go to adoration. I mean, these, the sacraments are the way, it, they're the place where we encounter Jesus Christ. And if what faith is, is coming to believe in Jesus Christ, then when we encounter him most closely in the sacraments, that's a place where our faith can expand because of the, the, the closeness of Jesus Christ, who is the root of faith. Also, faith increases... It's a virtue. Remember, it's supposed to lead to action. And so when we act in faith, when we live a life of faith, then the faith grows as we cooperate with it. And so if you want to increase the, the virtue through acting on it, remember there's two parts of the act of faith. There's the interior act of believing the faith. So they increase that well, by learning the faith. So everyone should be reading scripture for at least a few minutes every day to read the catechism of the Catholic Church, to come to talks like this, where people talk about the faith. You know, there's lots of opportunities, but learn the content of the faith. Also, to see the world in terms of your faith. It's not just one box in your head. Like, you know, you got trigonometry, and you have, uh, you know, that TV show, you know, whatever, uh, Seinfeld over here, and then you have faith over here. No, it, if, if it's the highest and most certain thing we know, it should be on top. It should be the most central part of our mental landscape, of our inner life. Uh, we should see the world in terms of it. So like, ask yourself, what references pop in your head the most? Are they cartoons when you were a child? Or are they some movie you like? Or is it events from the scriptures? What does your mind spontaneously go to when it's looking for examples? Is it ever the things of the faith? Or is it just things of popular culture? What are we feeding our souls with, Hollywood or God? And so if you want to grow in the faith, you need to fuel up on the faith. You need to, you need to fill your mind with the things that God has told us. And then you'll see things in the world in terms of it. That that light that's guiding you in your journey will get brighter as you feed it. A fire, if it's not fed, will eventually die out. So you've got to put kindling there to keep that fire bright. Also exterior acts. The, that's the second part of acts of faith. Do we profess the faith? And I don't mean like obnoxious people that are self-righteous and always just banging on whatever. I mean like are we willing to talk about it when it comes up? If we think it will help someone to speak about the faith, are we willing to do that? Or do we always shy away because we're afraid or embarrassed by the faith? You, know, you got to be prudent about this. You don't want to just beat people over the head with the faith. That doesn't attract anyone. But if it's appropriate, if it seems helpful in the moment, are we willing to share our faith with people? Because that's what will bring people to believe. It's that when they hear of your belief in God, your relationship, your friendship with Jesus Christ, 
then it makes that belief in Christ credible and believable to them. It opens for them the opportunity to also say, I believe in Jesus Christ, because your faith gives it credibility. And so it's important for you to share your faith. And as you do that, you'll grow in your own faith. You're not just helping other people, but you're helping yourself advance in your own spiritual life. So those are some ways to, to uh, grow in the faith. I had a section on what to do with trials of faith, but I, I don't think I have time to go through it all, so I'll just say what the root of it all is, is that if the faith is our belief in Jesus Christ. Whenever we face trials of faith, the most important thing to do is to stay close to Jesus Christ. He's the one we believe in. That's what everything rests upon. That's that sure foundation that can survive trials when other forms of belief fall apart. And so when we find ourselves wondering, do I still believe? Remember that it's not, faith is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It might include those things at times, but it's a firm yes to Christ, that I do believe what you have said. I do believe that you are the word of God. I do believe that you are my Lord and Savior. And so regardless of what might be going on in our emotional, subjective life, to stay on a deeper level of ourselves, closely rooted in Jesus Christ, to keep praying even when it's difficult, to keep close to the sacraments even when it's hard to, to bring yourself to it, to go to adoration and, and pray for that gift of faith. Because if you stay close to Christ, you're always resting on that sure foundation and that light will lead you to eternal life. Because ultimately what the faith is, the faith is a share in divine life. That remember how belief is not as good as direct knowledge? Well, what the end of our journey is, is to move beyond belief to direct knowledge of God. In other words, to see God face to face in heaven. We no longer need belief because we see for ourselves. And what the faith is, is a foretaste of the life of heaven, where we know indirectly now what we will know face to face in the future. And so what it is, the faith ultimately is a share in the divine life, even at this moment. Thank you. Good right, everyone. Let's do a uh, questions and answers or we'll, we'll never get out of here. So who's going to be the brave soul to ask the first question? Yes. I would like to. Oh. We have a microphone this time, so wait for the microphone. I would like to know how to reply to a Protestant about faith because I think what they think is faith is we just know there was Jesus historically or something. I don't know what they mean by faith and we mean something else. Could you explain the difference? Well, how we reply to them. What, what Protestants mean by faith, it, it means it's gonna, you're going to get different explanations. I don't know if there's a standard, the Protestant view on faith. Um, but I, I, I would imagine that what would really differ would be whether you're justified by faith alone. Uh, for a Catholic, we wouldn't, we wouldn't split it up as faith versus works, but we're saved by grace alone. And that, that grace empowers faith, and faith that's living is always is always full of charity so so if you're full of faith if you're full of that divine life you don't just get faith isolated but living faith is faith hope and charity and so that faith will naturally flow out into charity and to live that life of faith hope and charity is to grow to be a saint that's what the pilgrimage is is growing in those virtues and all that is only empowered because of grace so it's that grace underlying that will justify you and make you righteous in God's eyes. Um, so it's not just faith divorced from acts. We wouldn't accept that split. Right, any other questions? There's got to be more. This is going to be too short. Yes. Wait, wait for the microphone, please. So do you have like a three to five sentence answer for those atheists that you're talking that you were talking about at the very beginning who just don't accept faith? Don't well, I don't in general because atheists can mean a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna, you, you've always got to start with where people are because that, they're going to hear you from the place that they are in their own life. And so you've got to be willing to go to meet them in that place and then walk them towards the truth as much as you can. 
And so if it's someone doesn't believe in God, the first thing I would want to know is why. You know, you could have someone that doesn't believe in God for very intellectual reasons. Like you read Feuerbach and is convinced by the arguments. Well, in that case, you're going to want to try to talk about those arguments, so maybe proofs for God. Or it could be that they've had a lot of misfortune in their life and doesn't believe, can't believe that there's a God and such evil happens in the world. So in other words, it's going to depend on why that person doesn't believe in God. And you can't, you can't move someone to faith because it's a, gra it's a gift from God. It's a grace. And so it's only God that can give someone the faith. But you can be an instrument of God's grace, a God at work in this world. And so through, through talking to that person, you can be an instrument that God uses to offer that person the faith, that, to move that person towards the faith. But what's most important, whether you're dealing with atheists or anyone else, is that what you're doing when you're talking to someone about the faith who doesn't believe is that the credibility of the faith rests on you and the testimony you make. Because they're, they're seeing, well, should I believe you about what you say about Christianity? And so what, what most moves people to belief is love, when they realize that you love them, that you care about them. That's what moves people. If you naturally trust someone who loves you, it's in a real way, than someone who doesn't care about you. If somebody gives you advice and it's clear that they don't care about the outcome for you, they have no concern about your fate or future, you're not going to give it as much credence as someone who knows you and loves you deeply. And so the most important thing when talking about the faith that people who don't believe is to actually love them, to care about them, to want to see their, their salvation, to be on fire with charity yourself. And that will, is much more important than any great line you might have. Yes. Wait, wait for the microphone, please. Is this, does this do it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I find, I'm going to find myself on Sunday being co-pilot on an eight-hour road trip. And I know that eventually there's going to be a conversation and the driver does not believe in the true presence of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Now, I've read lots of things and answers and so on and so forth, and I can tell the scientific story about somebody who found a very old scrap yeah. of a Eucharist, and eventually, years and years later, it was given to a scientist, and it contained, they found, they contained DNA and RNA. Now, to me, that speaks volumes, mm -hmm. but I'm interested in science. This person isn't. Well, so, I, well, what I would find in, in conversations like that, well, first, it's going to depend well, I mean, on the personality of the person. But what matter, what matter, what is usually more effective rather than, because if you try to give arguments um, for like, well, theological arguments or whatever kind of argument, some people, that's what they want to hear. But for most people, the argument just goes on and on and on that's it. and on. And I and think so she I wants would, a feeling. Yeah, well, and so what, what you should talk about then is that how the Eucharist has affected you personally, your own devotion to the Eucharist, the role it plays in your spiritual life. And that's probably what you'll find more persuasive than RNA and DNA. Okay, well, I don't want to find myself going along okay on her thought and then find myself out in left field someplace you wondering all, how all, I got there. You always take a risk. You always take a risk. Okay, that's good. <laughs> risk we is good. We have a question back here. Hi. Can you give us more examples of preambula fide? Or like the, the, you mean the... the things that's useful to know that helps you to believe in believe. the gospel? Mm -hmm. Well, sure. I mean, some of the obvious ones would be that God exists, that God is a real person. Uh, and what I mean by that is some people say, well, yeah, there's some divine principle and it's really everything or it's like some force like in Star Wars. And, and the attraction of that is that an that uh, uh, impersonal thing doesn't make any demands on anyone. Uh, if God's a person, he might just ask you to do something. Uh, now, on the other hand, if he's a person, he might just actually save you. 
but that's a different side of it. Um, so, so believing that God exists, that God is good, that God's a person, those help. By believing that there's more to the world than matter, that soul and spirit exist. And there's tons of this stuff, and that's why there's a huge realm of Catholic, theolo or Catholic philosophy, all, the, thing, all the, the truths of the world that are in accord with Catholic faith. Um, that exists because there's lots of things that it's helpful to know to be a Christian. Um, so there's tons of it. it, it, it this is ex true also if you look to the Old Testament. Um, and what I mean by that is that, that God in the Old Testament was preparing a people to understand who Jesus was. So that if you know if Jesus popped up in ancient Greece and said, "I'm God," they might just say, "Great, why'd you do all the others?" You know, it was important for them to know that there was one God. You know, there's truths being taught in the Old Testament. They're not strictly speaking preambula fidei because they're revealed too, but they're preparatory to the fullness of revelation in Jesus Christ. And so, the preambula fidei are all those things that we know by natural knowledge, by our own use of reason, that help us accept the faith because we see enough of the truth to see how the faith fits in. Um, G.K. Chesterton had a great line in his, in his great book, Orthodoxy, where he says, the faith can be a strange shaped thing. I'm paraphrasing here, that it has all sorts of odd features. But when you see the world, you notice that all those odd features make the faith the key that fits into all the weirdness of our world and makes it unlock. It's like knowing the outline of where the key should fit is the preambula fidei that the faith fits into. Yes? This is wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you, Father, well, actually make a, a, an observation. When you were speaking and teaching us tonight, evangelization kept coming through as an integration. And I was thinking about the Dominican time on St. Hebrew Radio. And you're always speaking, you're doing catechesis, you're drawing, you're developing the So Well Dominican. But what people have said to me as they've listened is your community. They hear your laughter, they hear your camaraderie, they hear your sense of who you are. And it makes me think in our parish, in parishes, the pre evangelization piece is often the community mm -hmm. how we reach people, how we welcome them. We don't let them sit by themselves, we, um, we make ourselves present to them. And I think that's the piece that goes along with everything you're talking about tonight is kind of some, you would agree, maybe Absolutely. the open door to that. Yeah, that the, the seeing the charity attracts people because there's so much in the world, there's so much alienation, despair, loneliness. And to see communities where that's not the rule, where people not just get along, but truly care and love for each other and support each other, our hearts long for communities like that. We were made for that. And we see it, we find it attractive. That's why in the early church, one of the, one of the features of the church that drew so many of the pagans to become Christian was that they saw the love that Christians had within their families. They saw the love of spouses for each other, which is not the norm in pagan culture. That they truly cared about each other. That they cared about their children. They didn't leave their children out to die of exposure, but cared for their children, even the ones that were disabled how the Christians showed charity in the poor, where that was a foreign notion in the ancient world. Why would you care for the poor? You know, but they did. And that love they saw so manifestly in the early Christian culture and the church drew people in droves to become Christian because they longed to live in a community like that. In fact, that's what you mentioned to the Dominicans in specific. That's what drove, drew me to the Dominicans was that when I was thinking about the priesthood, I had a... Uh, I knew I was going to St. Uh, Gertrude Parish in Cincinnati, a Dominican parish, and I, I was helping with Theology on Tap at the time, and I had a Dominican come give one of the Theology on Top talk taps, or talk, talk, tap talks, okay. I've been up here too long, I can't speak. I had a Dominican come speak, and, uh, and he brought some of the other friars with him, and I saw how they interacted with each other, that the deep friendship and love that they bore for each other and I thought to myself, that's what I want. I want to be in a community like that. And so that's the very thing that drew, drew me to the Dominicans. And that should be true not just of Dominicans, but of the whole church, of all of us, of every parish, of every Christian family. And that's what will ultimately draw people, because they'll see the answer to the heart's desires written on the hearts of Christians. I can speak loud enough. 
you can't you can't speak loud enough to be on the radio. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> absent other questions, what does our faith tell us and suggest to us about our involvement, our interest, our active life in the affairs of the temporal aspect of our lives, the community, the city, the state, the world, mm -hmm. the political, the governmental. Where does our faith intersect on that? Well, the, so how does a Christian interact with the, the temporal world? Well, we're called to be the salt of the earth. We're called to be involved. We're called to be good citizens, to, to obey the law, to seek the common good of our land, to have patriotism, to care about the place where God put us, because where we're from is important. Christ was from a certain place in time, and we were placed ourselves in a certain place in time, among a certain people and a certain family, and we should have gratitude for that, and we should care about our country, we should care about the welfare of our country, even the politics of the country. But we have a different view on it all, because we know that this, this world is not final, that, that we're pilgrims, that we're strangers in a strange land, we're, we have dual citizenship, in other words. So while we love the country we are in, we realize that, that one day all the countries of this world will, will die away at the end of time. But all of us, who have immortal souls, all humans, have a destiny beyond this world. That, that what's really central is us as people, us as souls destined for eternity. And so while our countries are important, they don't have our final allegiance, that, that our true citizenship is in the heavenly Jerusalem. So, so we, it, it's always a complicated thing then, because you're like anyone with dual citizenship. You're, you're in both worlds, and you care about both, but there's a priority to them as well. Father, I've heard you talking about this evening about Christianity in general. In fact, that sounds like the whole total of your speech was Christianity in general, where we're part of Catholicism, which is a big difference between our faith and brand XYZ of Christianity. And I was wondering, I have a tendency to separate myself from other faith denominations. Yes. Maybe that's wrong. But I think I come from a true faith, and I want to practice it as best I can mm -hmm. in the context of the Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Whereas you talk about other faiths. Well, I, I actually, when, when I used the term Christianity, I was re referring to it in the, not in the sense as Christian versus Catholic, but I was talking about what Christ found at one church, and we were called Christians, so I'm reclaiming the term. I'm talking about the fullness of Christianity is the Catholic Church. Now, Protestants have part of the truth, but they don't have the whole truth. So when I was using Christianity, I wasn't meaning, I wasn't meaning at all in, in the dichotomy of Protestant versus Catholic. I was reclaiming it. But, uh, you know, certainly I, I gave a Catholic presentation. I don't think a Protestant would have mentioned the sacraments quite so much. But, uh, but I would hope that... They, Many Christians, if they're not Catholic, would also agree with most of the talk because they have large amounts of the faith themselves, that they have the scriptures, they, they have the belief in Jesus Christ as their savior, and, and all of that, and they can have true faith, and that applies to them as well. So. Yes, uh, microphone. This is not a question, it's more a comment. You said that some people are not willing to accept the truths of the Catholic Church so as to not have to leave. And the rest of this is my words, and part of that might be too. But I think you hit on a real key as to why some of our children refuse to come back to the church. They're not willing to give up that church family that they have or that relationship that they have with that minister or that spouse mm -hmm. or whatever. And I just want to thank you for that because yeah. that opened up a whole new viewpoint for me. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and some of that's gotten at when Christ says you have to love me before father or mother. You know, the, the, it's a tough saying, but, but what he's getting at is that our first priority has to be faithful to God. That all the other things we love in the world, whether family or friends or, or the things of the world, if Christ isn't at the top, if God's not first, then all those other loves get off track in all sorts of various ways. That's one of the reasons, I'm not going to get into Dante, but Dante's Inferno is all about that, about how if we don't put God first, even the things we do claim to love and love before God get twisted. And so that's why Christ is so emphatic, even to use stark language like he does, is why we have to always put God first, because, no, he's God. Right. We got a few minutes left. Okay, there we go. Uh, you talked about um, unbelief, right? Mm -hmm. um, is unbelief betrayal? Jesus said in the scripture, if you do not believe in me, you will die in your sin. So it is unbelief betrayal? I think some can. It depends on the nature of unbelief. And you could talk about it on different levels too. So on one level, all unbelief would be betrayal in the sense that we're naturally called to believe, that by our very nature, it, it, we're, we're, it's uh, a part of our nature to believe in God, to trust God. And so in, in that sense, all unbelief is a betrayal of our own humanity because we're, we're refusing to do something we were made for. Uh, on, a more, on, a, on a stricter level, some forms of unbelief would be um, betrayal. So like if you believed in the gospel and then you refused it, then you could see that as a betrayal because you've now refused what you once accepted. So I think that the, the answer would depend on, on what level do you mean betrayal? In, in Judas Iscariot case, was, it, was his fall completely because of unbelief or he did have some faith, right? Well, he, he, he would have had dead faith um, because to be living faith, it has to be animated by charity. And his act of betraying a friend under death was not an act of charity. So, so there was, so like the demons believe in God and tremble, but they don't have a living faith because it's not animated by charity. So to be a living faith, you have to have that charity. Faith, hope, and charity always go together. Thank you so much. Yeah. So before you had mentioned a crisis in faith or like what um, some mystics call the dark night of the soul. So it's a good test to see if you still have faith, the fact that you still have other virtues and charity. Would you say that's a... Well, well I, was, that I was speaking more broadly of any okay. style of faith, but, but you could get into the... You could certainly include the dark night of the soul type thoughts under that. But uh, yeah, I mean, to look... When you face, when you wonder like, do I still have faith? It's not, and this is true of all virtues, because virtues aren't feelings. You don't want to say, well, I'm not feeling it now, so it must be gone. Well, but what it is in and of itself is not a feeling. So if you don't have the feelings, it doesn't mean it's gone. But you need to look to see if in that part of you where it does exist. So for faith, it was what? It's a belief of the mind. Say, do I still believe God exists? Do I still exercise charity? Now, you can never... We're opaque to ourselves. We can't see into our own souls. We, we tend to know less about ourselves than our best friends know about us. And so it, it's hard for it. We can't judge our own spiritual state very often. But, it, but it's when that feeling is hard, you want to look to a deeper part of yourself. And that's often why God allows us to go through difficult periods where the, 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 you, know, you don't have butterflies in prayer, but it's hard and you don't want to do it. He does that to root those virtues, the root faith, hope, and love on a deeper part of ourselves. Because ultimately, it can't just be, I do it because it makes me feel good. It's got to be, I do it because, I, I'm, because I'm obedient and I love Jesus Christ, not just it makes me feel good when I do it. And you see that across the board, like in a marriage, is going to go south pretty quickly if it's just based upon fuzzy feelings for each other. It's got to be a deeper decision to love even when it's hard to love your spouse. And, uh, just like Christ loved us even on the cross, that we have to, even when it's difficult, continue. And that's how we grow. Right? It's just like a sports team in practice. If the practice isn't hard, they don't improve. 
Well, it's when our virtues, when our faith is tested is when it grows. And it doesn't make it fun, but, but it does make sense. Any last question? Last chance. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And Second, second Thursday of every month, so I hope to see you all here next month.